Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're returning to our Let's Play series against uh, XTRG in War in the Pacific, uh, Admiral's Edition. In today's episode, we are continuing our conflict against XTRG and hoping to continue to hold, hold the island of New Caledonia, the southernmost tip of that island, uh, just east of Australia. And we're also hoping to kind of get a sense of what he's doing in the Dutch East Indies. He's landed and he's taken several key bases on the island of Celebs. He's landed troops on Ternate. I think he landed troops somewhere else? I'm trying to remember. I've already seen the replay, so I don't want to spoil anything. But um, he's landing all over the Dutch East Indies, sort of the, the eastern portion of that uh, area. And we're really hoping that uh, we're able to delay him as much as possible. So far, he has not gone after the oil in the Dutch East Indies, uh, and that's been good for us because we are entirely powering Australia's economy based off Dutch East Indy fuel, and that has a double effect of us, one, bolstering our economy with a much more efficient uh, sort of convoy route, but two, uh, also being able to uh, deny him access to that fuel when he inevitably does take those islands and thus hurting the Japanese economy far more effectively than anything our early war Mark 14 torpedoes can do from a tanker destruction perspective. And so that's the situation right now. You can see we're in sort of the sub phase, a couple of subs firing torpedoes, a couple of subs missing. Japanese battleships are spotted near Amb Ambon uh, here in the Sarum Sea. So we've got the Japanese battleship Hagoya uh, currently bombarding Ambion or Ambon. Uh, and also the battleship Isa. So we're going to go ahead and fast forward through here. I need to go back and, and Yashimashiro and Fuso. Okay, so we know Fuso. We had a, a report that Fuso was sunk in a collision. We know that's not the case. Uh, four Japanese battleships are bombarding Ambon, which he must have... Uh, XTRG must have looked into the rules a little bit or looked into the allied, uh, the s allied setup there because that's the first time we've seen heavy Japanese assets bombarding any area that he's going to be landing at. And it's also the one area that has heavy coastal guns as well. So he clearly looked into that and knew that, hey, I can't just land uh, cargo ships at Ambon without, without adequate bombardment protection. And that's exactly what he did. Meanwhile, we can see here he's got some destroyer transports, APDs, uh, that are bringing troops to short Ambon as well. Our coastal guns, however, are not all silent there. You can see 150 millimeter coastal guns ripping into some of his APDs. Those are very useful little ships, probably more so if they were allied than, than Japanese, because the Japanese can transport troops via their fast destroyers, uh, just fast transports. Nonetheless, two shell hits on the Fuji, uh, heavy damage uh, reported to her, 54 casualties, five disabled, one gun destroyed. More troops unloading at Ambon. No Japanese losses there. Oh, shit. The Japanese are also landing at Kopang. So here on the island of Timor, that we have to be very careful with because that we have 160 aircraft at Java. We have a huge air armada at Java that we can't afford. I mean, a lot of them are Dutch aircraft that we'll probably just leave to die. But I think we've got like 70 or 80 British and American aircraft there as well that we definitely want to evac to Australia when the Dutch East Indy falls. So if his objective is to take Ambon, to take Celebs, and then to go after Timor and sort of cut across the northern sort of defensive positions north of Australia, then he may bypass Java and these other places, which might mean we have to pull our air units out a little bit sooner to avoid them not being able to shuttle out to Australia. Um, if, he takes Am if he takes Timor and he takes uh, Sumatra on the northern uh, Dutch, Indies, uh, Dutch East Indies area, then we'd have no way to evacuate our aircraft there effectively. So um, we need to be mindful of that. Obviously, it's not the only base here, but he is landing a considerable force here. We can see uh, Japanese infantry squads of the 4th Infantry Division are landing at uh, Kopang here on the island of Timor. 154 casualties, 5 squads destroyed um, landing there. And then he's also continuing to land here at Ambon, uh, bombarding here with his heavy cruisers now as well. So we first saw battleships bombard, now we're seeing some heavy cruisers bombard. We also saw some heavy cruisers at Kopang. So very strong Japanese surface naval assets. Unfortunately, we just don't really have much much in the way of uh, naval assets in the area to counter him. We've got a light cr carrier, which is air wing, was decimated. We have a he fleet carrier, which is moving south with basically no escort. And we have a lot of other light assets, but we also know the mini Kidubutai has been operating somewhere in this area and we would make mincemeat of any of those forces if we tried to approach their surface forces. And we can't even engage four battleships head-to-head because -head we don't have any battleships in the region. So... Um, it's we're kind of kind of screwed there 
Meanwhile, you can see these heavy cruisers are engaging in, with, in some gun duels here with our 150 millimeter coastal batteries. We put another coastal battery shot into the Minikaze, another APD, and uh, did some damage to our upper works. Fast forwarding through here, no hits on the cruisers. Four more hits on the APD Minikaze, four shell hits, heavy damage, heavy fires. Hopefully she sinks at least. Meanwhile, more troops are unloading at Ambon. Again, no damage suffered there. He's also landing at Kaving. Um, okay. Yeah, like a G-Men, we do have biplanes in the Dutch East Indies, so we need to be careful about that. We don't want them to get cut off and destroyed. They're good torpedo units. All right. Japanese destroyers are attacking our cargo ship. So this is, I think, the Yet Sun, which was attempting to get to Bataan. He obviously detached a couple of destroyers here to deal with it. So there may be no more supplies for Bataan here. These two Japanese destroyers closing in on this light cargo ship. Seven shell hits, one torpedo, and she goes down with 1,700 supply on board. At least those supplies won't go to the Japanese when they take Balak Papin. We have one other unit in the general vicinity that's a little bit further north. It's a, a uh, patrol gunboat, which has about 600 supplies bound for Bataan. So that's about half a day worth of supply when he goes with heavy air bombardment. But every little bit counts. It's basically a divisional supply for a full day of combat. So maybe it will end up uh, getting there. Meanwhile, the cruisers at Ambon again are bombarding and fighting. Uh, another couple more, sh couple shell hits. So 150 millimeter hit on the heavy cruiser Takao. Uh, didn't do any damage. Uh, uh, two more shell hits on the Namikaze, another APD. A shell hit on the uh, Nokazi, and two shell hits on the Swakazi. So his APDs are taking a bit of a drubbing here. He's using them kind of like armored landing craft here to get his troops in in a, in a hostile environment. But he's got three of them on fire, and one of them is suffering heavy damage. So uh, that that will at least give a pause to some of his forces that could be very useful in taking islands rapidly. Those APDs can be really useful in landing small detachments on islands all over the Pacific uh, because they're relatively fast, relatively well armed. Uh, you know, unless it goes up against a full-blown destroyer, it's going to deal with any, like, gunboats. Uh, and um, relatively cheap. So if we do some damage there, that, that certainly would be nice. Our S-boats firing and missing with their torpedoes. Getting depth charged here. Three hits. No serious damage. Another S-boat here firing against the, against the Achomaru, and she puts a torpedo into this. Oh, no. Hit no explosion. Oh, but another torpedo goes into her. Nice. So the S-36 is making uh, a good showing of itself. This is, again, the S-boats are the only American subs that don't use the Mark 14 torpedo. They use the Mark 10, which is less destructive but far more reliable. So two torpedoes into the Achomaru. Uh, heavy damage for that. A full-blown cargo ship off the base of Kendari. And uh, one dud still, but nonetheless, two out of three beats anything we've seen from the Mark 14. And we get that little flooding noise, which tells us she sank her ship. So that's great. Uh, finally, our subs sink an enemy, an enemy ship. That's the first we've seen sunk in a little while. Oh, boy. More debating of soccer, or are we just talking about what we talked about earlier? Uh, did, did Tortuga use his, fi his carriers without escorts and getting his air wings destroyed? No, I was just transporting my carrier from one safe zone to another, or what I thought was a safe zone. Um, and so it was, it was easier to move it without heavy transport. Meanwhile, the Japanese are moving some sallies in toward Rangoon, unescorted sallies. Our fighters intercepted, but didn't actually manage to do any damage, at least on the inbound strike. It looks like two of them were shot down by Flak. And now our fighters are engaging the bombers on their way out. We're diving on the bombers. They're coming in at 6,000 feet, so it's a little bit low. But it looks like we actually destroyed the enemy sallies, so that's nice. Two sallies destroyed here in the post-battle, but during the battle it looked like we got all three uh, without loss. So he now knows that we have a reasonably strong fighter force at Rangoon. It will be interesting to see how he responds next turn. I think maybe what we'll do is we'll stand all our fighters at Rangoon down next turn, because my assumption, based on the way he's operated in the past, is that he'll, if he has fighters nearby, he will probably send a heavy fighter sweep over Rangoon, but he won't risk more of his bombers. So we'll probably stand all our fighters down and just take the risk that he won't send bombers after him. Okay, some dive bombers here operating off Wankau. 
30 kilogram bombs are so fucking useless. All right. Chinese bombers getting through. Dropping their payloads but doing nothing. Those guys got through too. Before getting destroyed on their way out. Four 139WHs attacking the Japanese uh, ships at Kopang. And a AP here that they attacked. Strafed it. Didn't do any damage. Didn't look like the Japanese had a fighter wing covering. So that's kind of interesting. I wonder if more of my 139s could get in and perhaps hurt him a little bit. He's way outstripping his fighter support by landing on Timor. If, if only it was a little bit closer to Java, I would wipe those guys out. But obviously that's part of the plan, right? Okay, we're in the recon phase. Some Nates sweeping over Bataan. Uh, Crash, this is not a new game. This is a 10-year-old game, actually. Thank you for the follow, by the way. Yeah, this game came out 10 years ago. It's a remake of another game that came out even further ago. But it is still, to this date, the most detailed and uh, incredibly taxing uh, game looking at the Pacific Theater ever released. It models every single ground unit down to, like, the battalion level. It models individual squads within divisions. It models every single fighter squadron in, in the Pacific War. Every single cargo or merchant ship is modeled in the game. There are another air raid near Copang. Um, it models uh, the Pacific War in all of its grandeur and a daily turn resolution. So we've been playing this game against another human being. His, he's another YouTuber. His channel's name is XTRG. And we've been playing this... Uh, from the start of the war, December 7th, 1941, it is now February 2nd, 1942, and this series has been going for almost one real-life year, and we've only covered two months of the war. Now, most people who play by email play at a little bit of a quicker pace. As much as I would like to, I can't. Um, you know, my, my channel is not War in the Pacific. It's a part of my channel, but it's certainly not my whole channel. Um, so I have to play at probably two turns per week at a maximum, which means things are going to go way slower. But people seem to really enjoy it. It's a really interesting game, and um, I'm having a lot of fun with it. All right, so Japanese battleships are bombarding at Ambion again. We're going to fast forward through that. Doing more damage. I guess the one good news here is that the uh, the four battleships there are going to need to move somewhere to get supply, I would assume. Yes! Another torpedo hit! All right, the S... To the Dutch submarine, O-23, put a torpedo into the side of the Sawakazi. Heavy damage on fire. I think she's the one who took, like, the four shell hits from the 150mm guns. Let's listen to see if she goes down. Yes! We got the little flooding noise, means, which means she did sink. So this turn we have confirmed a sinking of a cargo ship, a heavy cargo ship, an AK, and of an armed PD. Or I, I, don't, I guess it's a personnel destroyer, a destroyer tro for troop transport. That's a pretty awesome little emoji there, like a G-Man. Yeah. That, that rocks. Was it really March of 2018? Has it been that long? To be fair, it took our our first week in the game, I think, took like three months in real life. We moved it at a, at a snail's pace for quite a while. And we've been moving at a much better pace lately. We've even had some days where there's like a day turnaround on the turns. But, um, yeah. Japanese deliberate attack here north of Xinyang against this Chinese core. Interestingly enough, they did not drive it back. The Chinese troops held their ground, which means they stay astride of the rail line south toward to Wuchang, which is good. Prevents rapid rail movement to his assault on Changsha. Japanese bombardment attack at Nomaya, so Nomaya will hold out for another turn. No damage for either side. Uh, deliberate attack at Hollandaya on the northern coast of Dutch New Guinea. That falls. There's no troops of ours there. Also an attack at Medang here on sort of the eastern coast of Pompon, New Guinea. Uh, another base that he takes without resistance. We have no troops there. Attacking at Ternate against a base force that we have there. He did take the base, unfortunately. The base force surrendered for the Dutch. So that is a valuable port and potentially an airfield. We also lost two Dutch recon aircraft that were on the ground there about 99 men lost 
No casualties inflicted on the Japanese. Allied bombardment attack against the elements of the 4th Infantry Division that just landed at Kopang. As soon as he attacks with that Japanese force there, we're going to be driven back. We have, we have nothing there. Japanese did lose a few casualties, disrupted. Bombardment attack at Ambion. I need to switch those guys into purely defensive mode. They might actually hold out for a little bit against... He only looks like he has an element of a brigade ashore. I don't know if that's going to be enough to unseat our forces there at Ambion. Meanwhile, a direct attack at Venomo. Again, another base on the New Guinea coast with no troops there. So he really got aggressive this turn, going after a ton of bases. And he did manage to capture several of them. Uh, P. Warner, I don't know if I have any troops nearby to reinforce uh, Papua New Guinea. Yes, Crash, this is definitely a game that would be played over a very long time. Um, there was an interview a couple years back with uh, sort of that the main business guy of the company that makes this. It's They're called 3x3 three three Games, or 2x3 three Games, or 3x3. Three three. I think it's 2x3 three Games. And um, he basically said the inspiration for a lot of these types of games, which the creator of the game is, is, is named Gary Grigsby, the creation of these games was, was really inspired by some of those mammoth board games that would take up someone's entire garage. So there are wargaming board game enthusiasts who have these massive maps like the size of a freaking car. Um, there was a Vietnam game that was like that. Thousands of chits and whatnot. And they, they sort of, though, that was somewhat of the inspiration for these kind of huge Gary Grigsby games. Games like War in the East, War in the West, War in the Pacific, um, and War in the East 2, which I believe is in development. And we're back. Hello, everybody. We're back. It is February 3rd, 1942, and the Japanese are on the move. In this last turn, the Japanese took several bases here at Holodania on the northern coast of the Dutch New Guinea uh, colony. They also took the base of Vanamo on the northwestern coast of northeast New Guinea in Papua New Guinea. Additionally, they took Madang. Madang is a far more important base. They can actually build this up to be a very strong air base of a level 4, uh, and they took that. They previously took Ley, which can be a level 3 airfield and is much more directly adjacent to Port Moresby. And they have already taken Buna, which is the most promising base on the entire north uh, northern coast, northeastern coast of New Guinea. It can build its airbase up to level 6, although it is hampered by only a level 1 supply. All of this is undoubtedly with the objective of eventually moving on and taking Port Moresby. Now, the good thing for us with Port Moresby, it's already built up to level 3 fortifications, uh, and we have a reasonable number of troops there. Like, he's going to have to deploy a considerable number, a number of forces here. Certainly something he's shown an ability to do, but in terms of the assault value of our troops here, he probably needs to deploy a full brigade, maybe even a full division, to take Port Moresby. That's the good thing. We could look at reinforcing Port Moresby, but that's going to be a little bit challenging. Um, I don't think I have a lot of shipping that can get in there and survive. I would love to rebuild the Port Moresby Brigade. And so we are moving several of these uh, companies of New Guinea rifles uh, in that direction so that we can do that eventually. Uh, but it's going to be at least a month away. So we'll see if Port Moresby isn't attacked by then. Uh, meanwhile, we have also dropped some mines at Port Moresby here, this Dutch mine layer. Uh, has dropped some mines here. So we do have some defensive mines, only 44 of them, but we have some, which would hopefully dissuade any invasion attempt. Um, that's about all we see in the area. He's also moving on Kavang. We've got an independent rifle company here. Uh, it's not going to hold out for very long. He's already taken Rabaul. Uh, I am trying to see if he's kept his division in Rabaul or not. Our Lark Battalion is actually... No, it's falling back on Gossima. Never mind. Never mind! Meanwhile, we're continuing to reinforce along the Fiji line at Nadi, at Suva, at Pago Pago. Uh, we're also looking at moving some troops into Norfolk Island or not. Huh. We had some troop transports that had a combat regiment, but now it's running away. Uh, I think that was because actually Norfolk Island doesn't have any, um, any port facilities, so you can't move them in with a transport. We need them in amphibious. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to move them to New Zealand. And then I'm going to have them unload there and potentially move over to Amphibious. But I do think an American Combat Infantry Regiment at Auckland would be very valuable to build New Zealand up and prevent any feasible attack. Meanwhile, uh, Gem Skull, thank you very much for the follow. All right. 
Uh, we've got some tankers that are heading back to the U.S. They've unloaded their fuel in Australia or New Zealand. Uh, a couple of task forces of tankers. Uh, meanwhile, I think we also just finished unloading some... Yep, this task force is... Actually, where are they? They're on their way to Perth. Uh, we've got this task force here, which is about to finish up unloading over 20,000 fuel at Melbourne. Uh, so the economy continues to sort of chug along here. Where are these guys going? Sorbaya. That's a long route to go. Uh, where are these guys going? Sydney. Okay. Uh, additionally, we have some more uh, supplies and troops coming into Perth. So we've got 23,000 supplies coming into Perth here on this convoy of cargo ships to help fuel the Australian uh, forces here. We've got 28,000 fuel coming in on these cargo ships. We have a lot of cargo ships mu moving fuel. It's a lot less efficient, but we have a massive surplus of cargo ships. We don't have uh, a surplus of tankers. And so using cargo ships in a tanker capacity is actually pretty useful. They can carry over 2,000 fuel. Uh, they only carry about 1,400 fuel in their bunkers when they're fully loaded. So that gives you a net benefit of, of 600, even if they use all their fuel up in transport. Again, it's not a huge amount of fuel, but it's enough. We've got a bunch of tankers up here in the north, uh, as well as some cargo ships that are all moving toward Perth. Um, two tankers here. Uh, I've kind of broken this group up just in the event. We knew that he had some light carriers here. They had, I think the last time we saw them, they were like right over here. Maybe if they were here, or, or actually, no, they might have been further north. They were attacking this group of ships. This group of ships was being just bombarded and destroyed by Japanese carriers. They're not worth anything. They were kind of our decoys. But he did have a bunch of carriers that were like kind of up in this area. And that's a little bit too close to our jugular. Like, he could sprint south and maybe go after all these tankers. So just as a precautionary measure, I broke these guys out into five separate tanker task forces. Uh, I'm also sending our uh, light carriers back north. Uh, just, again, to be safe in the event that he does sprint in any particular direction. I'm trying to get them a little bit out of the way. They don't have a lot of fuel. Broke these tankers up. I'm sending some of them to Carnivore. I'm sending some of them to Port Heland, and I'm sending some of them to Perth. Just in the event that, like, again, if he swings south, he won't ravish us. If he swings north, he might run into the Hermes, but I don't have much of a choice because we do have light carriers there. Uh, we also have some warships up here north near Cuckoo's Island. These are light carriers, though. And the last time, again, the last time we spotted them, they're right around here. I was kind of hoping to use this task force of worthless ships as bait, but they didn't get attacked last turn. So I don't know if that means he moved them back towards Celebs, if it means he moved them further west. I think it's unlikely he moved them north because we have so many aircraft. We have 189 aircraft at Sorabaya. So I think it's very unlikely he moved them north in this direction. We would have spotted them with all of our air out of Java. So that basically gives him three options. It means he either moved them west, which is certainly a possibility. We don't have a much. We don't have much out here. Um, he moved them south, but they're not yet in range of all these tankers. In which case, sort of breaking these task forces up is probably a smart idea. Or he moved them east, back out of danger. In which case. They're out of danger, so who cares? If he moved them that direction, maybe we cause a little bit of inconvenience by breaking some of these task forces up, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Uh, meanwhile, I'm also going to see if we can use a waypoint here. Just in the event he did move them west, I just want to try and divert a little bit. I don't have a lot of fuel to spare, but I would like to try and divert him a little bit out of the way so that he'd really have to go pretty far west to actually run into our light carriers here. Problem is they don't have a lot of fuel to do that. So we'll have to see. I mean, I, I don't want the carriers to run out of fuel mid-ocean either. So they'll divert a little bit west, which means he'd really, I mean, he'd have to be almost to the edge of the map. I think it's unlikely he would go this far west. Uh, and so we're pretty safe there, I think. Uh, meanwhile, we also have another carrier coming south here, the British carrier, uh, what is this, the Indomitable, which is hugging the western coast of the map. I think she's relatively safe. I was wrong. I thought she had no escort. She actually does have three destroyers in addition to a battleship. Uh, on our way to Perth. She's probably far enough out of out of danger at the moment uh, that we don't have to worry too much. And she's at the very edge of the map, so I think it's unlikely he sends anything that way. This was a relatively quiet turn, though, guys. I don't have a lot to talk about. Uh, we are moving a division here toward Pegu, or toward the force that we just drove out. Um, so if you remember, we uh, sort of ravished a Japanese uh, or a Thai infantry division here just south of Pegu last turn, and we drove it north. We are pursuing that division with the 16th Indian Brigade. It is moving, but it's going to take probably four more days for it to get here. Uh, the hope is that they can inflict more damage on the Japanese when they arrive uh, and maybe wreck that division permanently. Uh, meanwhile, the troops in Molmon 
have been given orders to strategically move to Pegu. So they had been cut off here. We're pulling them back to Pegu. It's a more defensible location. Uh, but it is going to take a day for them to all pack up. Last turn was that day. And so next turn they should start the 92-mile movement or 92 mile movement by rail. Meanwhile, in Singapore, he still hasn't moved troops in here. Singapore is actually increasing its strength. It's up to 100 and tw or 1,122 uh, defensive assault value here. Uh, it is up to, I think, level 4 fortifications, if I'm not mistaken. It is. Uh, and it's working its way toward level 5, although it's unlikely to ever get there. Uh, meanwhile, the Japanese units in Bataan are still kind of hanging out. They haven't started bombarding us here. We have level four fortifications. We're not building more because we are trying to preserve some of that supply. We have 38,000 supply. We were trying to get another 2,300 supply out of Balakpapan and out of Tarkin. One of our cargo ships here was sunk out of Balakpapan, uh, but now we're hoping that this uh, lone cargo ship, uh, the patrol craft Zeman, can get its 635 supply into Bataan. Uh, without uh, too much undue fuss. Uh, it is not detected, actually, so that bodes well for us. He has he had it detected last turn when it was closer to Tarkin. He no longer has it detected by anything, uh, which is good for us. We can't sprint it yet. It's not close enough. It would use too much fuel, but it is on its way. So it will probably be here by the end of the next turn. Maybe then we can sprint it. If not, then we'll probably have to wait till it gets to Buswanga. Uh, but the Japanese air coverage, I don't think... I mean, well, obviously, they haven't spotted it yet, so it should be hopefully relatively safe. Meanwhile, the Japanese have a considerable number of troops bottled up down here on the northern coast of Mindanao. Uh, we actually still have supply here at the base of Kagan. Uh, we have a couple hundred assault value, or at least over 100 assault value, level 2 fortifications. He's landed a couple of regiments and brigades, but not enough really to, to overwhelm us here on the northern coast of Mindanao. So we have sort of two siege points. We have Bataan, which is the last refuge on the island of Luzon. This is the main one. This has almost 2,000 assault value here uh, and a reasonable amount of supply. Uh, and then Kaigan, which has far less supply, far less entrenchments, but nonetheless is bogging down Japanese troops. The northern Japanese coast of uh, New or Borneo uh, is uh, sort of mostly Japanese by this point, but not entirely. He hasn't gone after bases at Kuching, at Swing Kang, uh, or any of those other bases. Additionally, Balak Papan has not yet been invested. Am I building fortifications here? I sure hope so. We are. Um, he's taken most of the island of Celebs, and with the reduction, or actually we should probably get these guys out of here. Um... Only one air capacity out of there? I guess we'll fly these. Can we even fly them to Darwin? No, we can't. I don't want to just lose six bombers just to lose them. But I don't even know if we can fly them out of that base. We'll have to see. Meanwhile, Copang is a pretty big base. At level three port, level six air, this could be a major obstacle for him, and he could use it to cut off our entire withdrawal point from up here in Java, like I was talking about earlier. So we have almost 200 aircraft at Surabaya. I'm not sure what we should really do. I mean, we could probably just jump them down to Dili, and then from Dili we can move them into northern Australia in the event that we have to. Additionally, we could fly them to a base... Uh, well, not really. We could potentially fly them to one of these bases here with no troops on it, uh, which is certainly a possibility if there's an airfield on any of these guys. Oh, shit. There's not. Well, there is here at Dili. I was, uh, I guess the main force is over here at Latum. So we have to keep an eye on this. Like, if he sends more troops down toward Timor, we may have to evacuate some of these aircraft pretty quickly. The alternative is evacuating them north, where he's less likely to go after a base at, like, Sabang. Uh, but that would involve moving them into Burma, and it would really prevent us from using any of the Singapore sort of ev evacuees as any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, reinforcement of Australia. Meanwhile, we're moving some more fighters into Rangoon. Uh, we've had a shuttle service going between Blair and Singapore to get as many of the fighter aircraft that we had at Singapore out of there. As you can see here, I'm slowly moving these forces in this way. Uh, I don't know what that accent was supposed to sound like. It was like three different accents mixed into one. All right, so can we move these guys to Rangoon right away? They've got drop tanks. Drop tanks means you should, right? Doesn't look like they actually can make it. Oh, they can. Nice. All right. So those those uh, were they were they P40s that made it? Those guys can't. 
So they'll move there, the Flying Tigers. And then we've got one disabled Buffalo that's going to be stuck at Sabang. Meanwhile, we've got a couple more aircraft. These H-81s, uh, Flying Tigers, are going to move again to Sabang. So that's the direction their units moved. And then we've got three Aero Cobras, another H-81, and another Buffalo that are currently disabled at Singapore. But only five aircraft are left at Singapore. We've gotten most of them out. Meanwhile, we're up to 130. I thought it was way more. No, that was that was Java. Up to 130 aircraft at uh, Rangoon here. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to go ahead and stand down all of the fighters. I think, or at least I don't want, I don't want any of them doing cap duty. I just I don't want to risk him running a massive fighter sweep of zeros over Rangoon and having our entire fighter force just obliterated in one fell swoop. So I'm thinking we'll we'll stand these guys down. It's a risk. Admittedly, it's a risk. He could go for a massive bombing raid against uh, against Rangoon and, and knock out a bunch of our aircraft on the ground. But um, XTRG has not shown a tendency to do that. We gave him a really bloody nose over Singapore. And ever since, he's been really reluctant to do anything like that. So I'm going to take that gamble that he won't do that. Okay, B-17Ds. I think we have a couple of those here. Ancient Gamer, thank you very much for the follow. I appreciate it. We've had quite a lot of new followers in the last few days. Several people donating bits. J Street, like a G-Man. We've got, I think we're up to seven subscribers on the channel. As a reminder of those of you who do have Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to one channel per month for free, and it does help the uh, develop the streamer out. Also, there's, um, I think, supposedly September is like Amazon Prime, like, subscription, like paid subscriptions or half off. I think I heard that somewhere. I don't really, I don't push this stuff all that much. Um, but it, it is nice. It does help. Um, okay, so we are up to 20 strategic bombers at Rangoon. Um, yeah, so we'll do, we'll keep doing that. I'm not going to change anything there. Meanwhile, let's take a quick look at China. I don't think much has changed in China. We've got the one core here that he's uh, attacking with a large force. That's being a bit of a nuisance. We've got the 45th Chinese Corps, which is going to actually move in and intersect Sing Kang and Hankou. So as soon as he drives these guys back... Uh, he'll probably finish driving them back next turn. Uh, but in probably three or four more days, uh, maybe five maybe five more days, we're going to have troops between Sinkang and Hankou uh, that are going to be doing the exact same thing as these troops to the north, just irritating the Japanese and, and forcing them to divert attention. Meanwhile, interestingly enough, I don't think he bombarded Changsha last turn. So that's useful, I suppose. We still have about 5,000 assault value there. Uh, it's a level 5 fortification. Not enough supply, but from what I've heard is level 5 forts are actually so hard to overcome anyway uh, that it, uh, it might be worth making a stand here. Meanwhile, Wang Kao continues to hold out. Uh, not a great amount of supply there, but it does manufacture some supply. So the 100th Chinese Corps, which is really the anchor of our defense, still looks in reasonably good shape. 21st Corps was recently just driven out of Puchang. Uh, they're kind of chilling out here, just, you know, keeping these Japanese troops a little bit occupied and busy. Uh, and uh, not a lot else going on this turn. Did I move anybody else around? Was I moving anybody else? I can't remember. It doesn't look like it. Um... These troops here, west of Changsha, about a thousand assault value. Got about another six hundred assault value here. Down at Hang Yang. Um, yeah. Okay. So that looks at kind of the Chinese theater. Not a lot else has changed. Actually, let's see if any more of these aircraft are ready. Yes, okay. Several more of these flying tigers. If, if you don't remember, several turns ago, we had the flying tigers get ambushed over uh, over the base at Chengtheth. And they inflicted some casualties on the Japanese, but they got ripped apart pretty bad. Um, and then several of them were damaged on the ground by Japanese bombing raids. So of a force of like 40 fighters, I think we ended up having like 10 that were still serviceable. The good thing is he hasn't continued to pound those bases. We've got about 10 more that are still not serviceable. And for the other guys, uh, we did pull back about, what is this now, 16 Flying Tigers to uh, toward Chongqing. So we have 
uh, salvage 16 of those. Another 10 are waiting to be salvaged. That'll be about 26 of our force um, that we lost pretty heavily from. So that'll be nice. I'm going to stand these bombers down because they're probably going to get shot to pieces if he puts any fighter escorts up there. Um, what else? Not a lot else to do in this area. We still we don't have any sighting of the Japanese carriers over here, as I was kind of talking about earlier. So we're taking some precautions just in case. Not a lot of new sightings over here in the South Pacific. No real task forces that look like they're headed toward anything in particular. These are all withdrawing task forces. Or sorry, actually, they're moving west. So they might be reinforcing Lei or Buna. They might be going for Wow or Lei or Finnish Fashion, but I can't really do anything about that. None of these guys are moving south. No sightings of anything anywhere else. The troops at Nomaya continue to hang out. They've been like two, three weeks now that they've been holding out against overwhelming odds. But so far, they're hanging in there. Their massive casualties kind of work to their advantage in that, you know, when you've got enough supplies for 10,000 men for two weeks, uh, when suddenly 8,000 of those men are no longer eating food because they're dead, the other 2,000 have a lot more supply for them. So you can see here that our supply required for supply on hand, uh, pretty favorable to the defenders, although they're... Uh, outnumbered by something like 5 or 10 to 1 in terms of assault value. They are trying to build those fortifications back up to level 2. They're currently at level 1. Suva, I think, is level 3. They are. They're good ways toward level 4. Nadi is it currently at level 2. They're almost to level 3. Pago Pago, meanwhile, is at level 3, working toward level 4. They're also working to expand the port capacity to 3 and the airfield to 4. When they do that, that's going to make Pago a really tempting target for the Japanese because they, they can really value a, a well-developed port down here and airfield. The good thing for us is we have more than a division worth of troops just kind of hanging out here. I don't have a lot else going on this turn. We do have the carriers moving toward New Zealand here. Uh, so they are moving toward uh, New Zealand in the direction of Australia. They still have a reasonable amount of fuel. They haven't been detected or anything like that. Um, they're still in good shape. We also have some tankers trailing them over, not there. Where are those tankers? They're way behind now, about 20,000 fuel. But we've got plenty of fuel in New Zealand for them anyway. Um, the battleships at Pearl Harbor, we've got six of them. Some of them are repairing, so we actually have four battleships currently repairing. But one of them, which took a torpedo and a bombardment strike on Midway, is only about nine days away from being back in service. So that'll give us another battleship in service. In addition to the two, the Mississippi and the New Mexico that are already here and in good shape. Um, additionally, we have two more battleships on the way. So we'll have five battleships between the one that'll be ready in nine days and the other two that are already there. The Colorado and then the British battleship, the Warspite. The Colorado just went through an upgrade, so it now does have radar. The Warspite already did. So that'll give us five active battleships with the fleet in Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor really didn't hurt us very hard. And then a sixth, the Idaho, is on the way as well. All upgraded to their January configurations. Um, meanwhile, these guys are still trying to catch up and merge with this task force. I don't know if they're going to do that. We'll have to see. We may have to pull them back or something. Um, bunch of task forces here moving here, some aircraft that are on their way toward Pago Pago, uh, some troops that are going to Christmas Island, uh, San Diego, San Diego, some returning ships. Why are these guys going to San Diego? I guess these just must have carried troops to Pago Pago. But, uh, yeah, that's the situation right now. Not a lot else to do this turn. We go and we take a look at the intelligence, or sorry, the intelligence from this turn. Both sides lost one aircraft in air-to-air -air combat. The Allies lost four operational aircraft to four Japanese. Three aircraft destroyed by flak. So in terms of actual losses, it's 8-8. Eight eight. Japanese lost three Sallies. Uh, the Dutch lost three of the recon aircraft. That's not really much of a loss. The Japanese lost two Mavises. We lost two SB-3s in China. One Topsy, one Ida, one Nate, one Catalina, one Empire, one DC-2, all potentially lost. In terms of top pilots, uh, one KIA for a pilot lost. None of our aces this turn anyway. In terms of ships sunk this last turn, we claim the Achu Maru with our Mark 10 torpedo near Kendari. We also claim the Sokwazi uh, near Ambion with a Dutch torpedo but also took some shell hits. Uh, the Japanese destroyed the Bittern, an armed mine layer, 
of the 250 kilogram aerial bomb at uh, Botswana, and then the yacht Shin uh, was sunk by Japanese torpedo in her Twai Twai. Where is Botswana? Is that over here somewhere? I'm not really sure where that is, but that is an aerial bomb, which is interesting. Where is that base? List all bases. It's alphabetical. Um, I don't even see it on here. Could it have been Bishwanga? It's in the Philippines? Did I misread that? Yeah, I did. Okay, so that's in the Philippines. So the bittern is, that's a 250 kilogram bomb. Actually, it's right here. Okay. Whatever. Don't really care about that. Okay, motor torpedo boats, patrol boats. Uh, Force Z repairs. Good question. <clears throat> so if you look at Cape Town, uh, the repulse is under repair. She's going to be under repair for a while. Uh, she's going to be out of action for another 93 days, uh, which will bring her out of dry dock in about April. Um, and so that means she's out of the fight for a while longer. Uh, that being said, she did survive. She made it out of, of the worst of it. Repairs are progressing pretty well. Uh, meanwhile, the Prince of Wales has not yet made it there. She is on her way. She'll probably be out of action in like a year and a half. I don't think we'll see the Prince of Wales again until 1944. With that massive amount of float damage, she's going to be out of service, out of commission for quite some time. Nonetheless, he doesn't get the how many victory points? 202 victory points for sinking her at the very least, even if we can't use her. Um, but she's still on her way to Cape Town because she can only make nine knots, which is actually better than she could when we first left. I think it was like six or seven knots when we first left. Uh, at current speed, it uh, looks like she's probably 12 turns away, or no, six days away. Um, so she'll be there in less than a week, uh, can start the repairs. Uh, but that's going to leave the Cape Town docks kind of crowded. So we'll have to sort of see how that impacts. We may have to set the Prince of Wales to a low priority. Meanwhile, I've got several ships and forces here uh, loading up at fuel at Abaddon. We also have the 6th Australian Desert Rats Division that is on the way to uh, India. Or no, not, not those guys. Those are Royal Air Force Squadrons. Uh, 30,000 troops here. So we've got the 6th Australian Infantry Division on the way to Australia here. Uh, the Desert Rats. So that's good for us. Um, these strategic squadrons have stratted up. So we've got two uh, RAF squadrons that are ready to move. We also have some transports on their way to Karachi to move some RAF squadrons as well. But I think, do we have any more? We do have more troop transports. So I think we'll go ahead and load some of these guys with no escorts. Don't worry, Japanese submarines would never hurt us. Load some of these group task forces up as well. I think we're going to move them. All right, let's get more ships. All right. So I think we're going to send these guys, including their DC-2 cargo transports, to Karachi so they can move their uh, supplies into China more effect effectively over the hump. Also, the fact that they're moving without escort makes that relatively easy. At least relatively risk-free. Nothing else really to do or to talk about this turn. We've got some troops in movement. We've got some things going on. Uh, but really the key question is, where is the mini Kitty Butai? Uh, where is it? Last we saw it was over in this area. We've got some shipping, but there's also some gaps here. They could be in here easily. I don't think they're up here, uh, but they could be anywhere between here. Uh, without our ability to cite them, so we'll have to figure that out. Um, I did move some uh, recon aircraft here to Geraldton and also to Canavora, although they're currently repairing there, so they won't be in there for a few days. 
the troops at Ambion have been landed against. Uh, we probably should fly this Catalina out of here so it doesn't get destroyed. So we'll fly this uh, recon aircraft. Can we get them to Australia? We can't. They're restricted headquarters, so we can fly them somewhere else. Uh, which I guess we'll fly them over to Latern. Um, I think that's going to do it for this turn. So I appreciate you guys tuning in for yet another episode. For those of you who are watching the stream, don't go anywhere yet. I'm not going to actually turn off the stream. I'm going to look at some other stuff and give you some more information. That's the benefit you have for showing up to the stream is that I can respond to personal questions. This first bit will be on YouTube. And so those of you watching on YouTube, I do want to thank you once again for tuning in for yet another episode. And until next time, I'm out.